Good afternoon. I'm going to say that one more time. I can see some people in the room. Now I want to hear them. Good afternoon. And I know you can do better than that. Good afternoon. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you all so very much for being here today. I'm Deborah Duncan, the host of Great Day Houston at KHOU Channel 11. And we've had the Miniger Clinic on our show over the year for some very uh, impactful and, and useful things for people in our community to, to use whenever they're feeling like their health is at risk, their mental health in particular. My mental health was at risk um, outside in the, the traffic earlier. <laughs> but because of Miniger being on our show, I knew how to cope with that. The one thing I'm having a hard time coping with, and perhaps some of y'all can help me after the program, is this right here. They said it would happen, and it did. Reading glasses. Proceeds from the Lunch and Support Miniger's work to advance the treatment of mental illness like depression, anxiety, addiction, and a whole lot more. As one of the nation's top five psychiatric hospitals, Miniger conducts one-of-a-kind research and educates the nation's most talented up-and-coming psychiatrists, psychologists, psychiatric nurses, and social workers. We've got a great program lined up for you today, including our inspirational signature speaker, Brandon Marshall. Before we start things off, though, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank some very important people. Now, put this in perspective. All of you are important. These people are just a little bit more. <laughs> First, a very special thank you to our luncheon host committee members and our wonderful luncheon chairs, Kate and Jim Likes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Several Menninger board members are also here with us today, so please join me in thanking them for their service with a round of applause. Raise your hand in the air like you just don't care. And of course, we cannot forget our generous sponsors, our Future in Mind sponsors, the Lewis L. Boric Foundation, Sarah and Doug Poche, the Mackingvale family, Vivi and Chris O'Sullivan with the Letty Knapp and Chris Knapp. So thank you very much. Our leading mind sponsors, the Quinod families with Indumar Products, and also thanks to our generous in-kind donations from Stamp Out Stigma sponsor, the Stanford and Joan Alexander Foundation, our staging uh, sponsor, can you guess who that is? Gallery Furniture. Buy it today, take it home today. They save you money. And also, our floral sponsor, HEB. And by the way, start thinking about who at your table will be able to take those flowers home. We don't want like a fight to break out after the luncheon. It's just, it's not pretty. So y'all decide, discuss, use your tools to discuss who's going to be able to take those flowers home. I know you're anxious to start eating, so please join us for the invocation led by Minninger's chaplain, Reverend Salvador Del Mundo, Jr., which, by the way, his name means... Savior of the world. Thank you. I'd like you to join me now in the spirit of prayer. Spirit of life and love, healer of minds and hearts, you make your presence known to us in different ways and through different experiences. Today, may we experience your presence in fresh ways as we come together to build bridges of understanding and cooperation. May we find new connections that translate into deeds of justice and compassion. Here is our chance, once again, to be part of a wider and empowering community, to live like we wish the world would live, to reach our potential to engage in efforts for social justice for which so many of us yearn. And even as we live in an imperfect world, remind us once more that the primary act of faith in the goodness of life is engaging in the kind of restorative work that heals, binds, and makes whole what is fractured and broken. This, then, is our prayer, that you will raise leaders, catalysts, change agents who will carry on with the work of dreaming dreams, realizing visions, and opening new avenues that makes for social justice. Enable us to find ways to be inclusive of persons living with mental illness in our everyday lives. Be with the doctors, nurses, therapists, researchers, social workers, clergy from all faiths, and all those in the helping professions as they seek to overcome ignorance and injustice with care and compassion, as they continue to make a difference in confronting the stigma and marginalization of people struggling with mental illness. Continue to inspire and challenge each of us here to join partner and collaborate with one another in breaking down barriers confronting mental health, from prejudice and injustice to ignorance and indifference 
so that all people may have the freedom to become all you created us to be. Remind us of the power of hope to triumph over fear, the power of love to prevail over the horrors of hate and marginalization, the potential for peace to be victorious over hostility. At this point, I'd like to end my invocation with words borrowed and adapted from the prayers of Rabbi Rami Shapiro, a prayer to live with grace as we remember the dear people in our hearts who struggle with mental illness. May they discover through pain and torment the strength to live with grace and humor. May they discover through doubt and anguish the strength to live with dignity and holiness. May they discover through suffering and fear the strength to move toward healing. May it come to pass that they be restored to health and to vigor. May life grant them wellness of body, spirit, and mind. And if this cannot be so, may they find in this transformation and passage moments of meaning, experiences of love and connection from family and friends, and the deep and gracious calm that comes as they give themselves permission to move on. For the blessings which we are about to partake, in the company of friends, peers, and colleagues, may we truly be grateful. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Salvador Del Mundo. My name, Deborah, means bumblebee. I'm not quite sure what that is. I'm going to try to work that out. Uh, in the meantime, enjoy your lunch and finish working out the uh, floral arrangements. And we'll be back in just a few minutes with the rest of our program. Thank you for, very much for being here. Kate and I sincerely want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. Your time is very important, and we really appreciate you spending your time with us to support mental health. It is always such a joy to hear Brandon Marshall talk about mental health and his fight with borderline personality disorder because he is so open and honest about it. You will be inspired to hear his story and his openness about his disease. He is leading the charge to eradicate the stigma of mental health. Kate and I were so excited and honored when asked to chair the Miniger Luncheon. Not long ago, I began to ask myself why I was so excited about this opportunity and what I hoped to accomplish. It is plain and simple. I want to save lives. I want to do my part in fixing a mental health system that is broken. Think about it. One in four adults experience mental illness each year. That's over 60 million Americans. And 20% of our youth suffer from severe mental disorders. I've been around mental illness my entire life. Growing up, my father, who graduated medical school at the age of 22, was diagnosed in 1971 with bipolar disorder. For the most part, our, our, our family lived normal lives, but was well aware of the symptoms of bipolar. The challenge for our family was that we knew our father's disease needed to stay within the family because we could not take the chance of letting people know of his disease. Our father's love and passion has always been medicine and helping others. The threat stemming from the stigma of mental health was too much of a risk for us to discuss outside the family. What I learned is that my father was challenged in two ways. On the one hand, he had to deal with and manage his mental illness. On the other hand, he was challenged by the stereotypes and the prejudices that result from the misconceptions of mental illness. Why should mental illness be, uh, be looked at differently than a physical illness? Some of the most talented people in history battle mental health. Abraham Lincoln, Ernest Hemingway, J.P. Morgan, Beethoven, Michael Phelps. Kate and I have been happily married for over 20 years and we have four beautiful children. Our oldest daughter, Peyton, grew up a young, intelligent, full of life child who would always give our friends the biggest hugs and a gigantic smile. But by the age of 12 years old, Kate and I noticed Peyton's personality began to change. It was subtle at first and we questioned whether it was part of her becoming a teenager. She became more isolated lost her desire to go to school or her energy to play sports. She would oftentimes just stay in her room all day and listen to music. One day we noticed marks all up and down her arm. She had been cutting. When we confronted Peyton about the cutting, she, took, she told us she did it because it helped make the pain go away. You could not imagine how this made Kate and me feel. How does such an incredible young lady who has so much emotional pain that she has to do this to eradicate the physical pain. We knew the seriousness of the situation, but frankly did not have a clue where to start in order to get her the help she needed. 
We began by getting a recommendation for a family pediatrician for a psychiatrist who could help. The doctor misdiagnosed Peyton and sent her home with several prescriptions. We noticed quickly that the medicine not only did not help, it was making things worse. Her state of mind was becoming more isolating and depressed. Peyton was beginning to have suicidal ideations. Kate and I were struggling because we wanted to help Peyton so badly, but we didn't have the answers, didn't know where to turn. Kate and I had to be mindful that we had three other children that we needed to maintain normal lives with while we were in crisis mode. Kate and I didn't sleep much. Instead, we began educating ourselves on the various mental illnesses, surfing the internet on hospitals, on schools, doctors, trying to find answers. One day, Kate came across a local educational consultant who we decided to call. With the help of this consultant, we agreed the best course of action was a wilderness program followed by therapy at a residential treatment center. Although we felt strongly that it was the right step in order to save our daughter's life, there was also a part of us that questioned whether we were making the right decision. Ultimately, Peyton was tested by a doctor who performed a thorough evaluation and diagnosed her with borderline personality disorder. Since being correctly diagnosed, Peyton's treatment has included psychotherapy, medication, and a group and peer support. However, it was not easy putting together the right team to support Peyton. It took a lot of effort and support from friends and family, many of them who are here today, and I thank you guys, by the way, who helped us guide to the team Peyton has today. What Kate and I cannot understand is why a child, when a child is diagnosed with leukemia, the child is rushed to Texas Children's Hospital where a team is put together and a protocol is in place to give that child the best opportunity to beat the disease. Yet when a child is diagnosed with mental illness, it is essentially told to, the child is essentially told to figure it out on his or her own. That's what needs to change. Let's help the 30 million people uh, who currently do not seek treatment for mental illness get the help they need. Practically all mental illnesses can be treated successfully if given a chance. There is not a day that goes by when somebody approaches Kate or me about a friend, a family member, even themselves, who is struggling with mental health and looking for guidance. My goal for being here today is to save lives. Finally, I want to let you know that both my father, Fred Likes, and daughter Peyton are here today. I'm happy to say that after 50 years of medicine, my father retired last year from an incredibly successful career, touching thousands of lives. And Peyton is about to graduate high school and will begin her career, her next chapter in life, by attending college and continue to work on her mental health. I am so proud of both of you for your strength and courage. Thank you all for being here. He covered up my notes. <laughs> Last time I tried to be profound and funny in front of a group this size, I was at my mother's funeral. So I had a pretty captive audience because that would be just rude to leave in the middle of a eulogy. But today you're in luck because I'm going to try to be meaningful here in less time than it takes you to brush your teeth. We have all invested precious time and money today because we know the statistics. We know that one in five struggles with mental illness. That's an average of two people at your table. We know there's still a stigma, so we're not talking. We know the parity law, which requires mental health claims to be covered similarly to, physical, to medical claims, is not a full reality yet. No wonder only half those that need help are actually receiving it. No wonder the largest mental health system in the U.S. is the prison system. We say that the youth is our future, yet the statistics are still no different amongst our youth. No wonder almost 40% of our youth that struggle with mental illness drop out of school, and it's their third leading cause of death. We don't need my CPA license to know that that's not working. Dr. Freirich of MD Anderson introduced a treatment for childhood leukemia that is still the protocol today and is the one that saved our niece's life. That development was 70 years ago. And I know that we're all here today because we believe we have a similar story to tell about mental health one day. 
Robin Roberts of Good Morning America would call all this, fondly, our mess. She has fought and survived cancer in the public eye, and she put her mess out there in order to be an example to make your mess your message. Jim and I are here to make that message our mission. We want to move from words that inspire thought to action that inspires change. As one of the premier providers in this country, Menninger, along with the Baylor College of Medicine and over 4,000 patients, has created the largest mental health research database. It includes brain images, genetic information, and clinical outcomes. That knowledge can one day translate to objectively defined treatment and insurance coverage protocols. That greater coverage will lead to greater accessibility. That greater accessibility will lead to more proactive and less, instead of reactive treatment, and less collateral hurt along the way. At the same time, Menninger is increasing its reach to at-risk students through its Bridge Up program. I was born and raised in Galveston, which is a significant, significant beneficiary of this service. Accessible, comprehensive, pervasive impact will elevate the health of our entire community. The skills that Jim and I have learned along the way are not just those for a certain diagnosis. They're life skills. They help us through our everyday feelings like fear and guilt. How many of you have ever procrastinated out of fear? Whether it be starting a new business venture or asking someone to say, write a check to come to the Menninger lunch. For many of us, we believe that we miss 100% of the shots that we don't take. But for others, I learned this from Peyton, the shots we don't take, we can't miss. So sometimes we question trying. One more question, let's keep those biceps burning. How many of you have ever felt guilt or shame over something you wish you'd done different? I'll probably be wishing that right after I shut my mouth. <laughs> for many of us, guilt can lead to taking ownership, granting forgiveness, and building relationships stronger than they ever were before. But for some of us, guilt becomes shame. Self-worth and repair seem really far away. For many of us, overcoming fear and guilt can be resolved by an item on our to-do list. For others, overcoming fear and shame means to get out of bed. Without our, with or without a mental illness, we have more in common than we think. We just think about what we have in common differently. Jim and I have indeed learned a lot, but we are certainly not licensed therapists. Frankly, we're not licensed parents either. I'm sure our kids would stand up to a dispute our dis dissertation if given the chance. But if Minniger ch could change the statistics alone, we wouldn't be here. So what is our role in supporting healthy children in our schools, healthy employees in our offices, and healthy friends in our neighborhood? Whether we realize it or not, if one in, every, if one in five people needs your support, and frankly we all do from time to time, right? then we are a part of someone else's work to be well. Just think of how many opportunities every single day we have to make a difference for someone else or allow them to make a difference for us. It is in these everyday little things that Malcolm Gladwell defines the tipping point. The point at which the little things in everyday life reach a critical mass. When the messages and the behaviors spread like a virus. I never knew I wanted to become a virus, but I think I do now. I have now given my 18-year-old yet one more reason to want to launch from our house. What could our role be in that tipping point? What could that look like? How about a job interview? Peyton just shared her growth from her mental health treatment. It clearly differentiated her. She nailed her interviews and she just landed two, first, two jobs. How about at a holiday party? Not the most likely of places, but I happen to throw out borderline personality disorder like a manicure. I now have two new friends 
and as of yesterday have four organizations that are gathered, that are excited to gather around the table and talk about how we can expand services to an entire community, their teacher, not just their teachers, but the youth and their families, and some of the funding to get started. I want, to I want to reiterate that whether you realize it or not, you are a part of someone's hard work to be well every day. What do you want your part to look like? I implore, share your gifts. Explore curiously. Listen openly. And speak authentically. I challenge you to deliberately step on the scale and tip it. Thank you. Thank you. We are humbled. I would now like to pass the mic to, I'm looking over there and wondering where they are, to Tony Gaglio and Dr. Aldum. Welcome. Um, Tony Gaglio, I'm the interim CEO, and I have the pleasure of leading this organization at the moment and to share this time with all of you. I want to thank you for being here to support the work that's being done at the clinic for raising awareness around mental health. We are grateful to each of you. To Kate and Jim, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you for everything you've done for the clinic, and thank you for helping other families. The more we talk about mental health, the better. Mental health illnesses are extraordinarily common. As we heard today, up to 60 million people are affected by mental health issues, and as also we heard, more than half never seek treatment. With the rising rates of depression and suicide across the country, it's never been more important than now to start those conversations about mental health. Let those who are struggling, let others know that they are not alone. Mental illnesses are treatable, and like many other diseases, early in intervention is key, so let's be sure that we're having those conversations. At the Menninger Clinic, our mission is to help children and adults heal from those mental illnesses so that they can live their best life. During the past year, we are really proud to, uh, to announce that we are ranked number five on the US News and World Reports as a best psychiatric hospital. And as a matter of fact, that's 29 consecutive years that Menninger has been identified as such. Menninger offers inpatient and outpatient programs for a wide range of mental health conditions, and again, both ch serving children and adults, and we're particularly known for our success in treating complex cases. Recently, we launched a new program. It's the only program, it's a private program of assertive community treatment, referred to often as a PAC team, the first private in Texas. We refer to this as Menninger 360. This is an innovative program that pr brings together a team of professionals and brings them to, uh, around the client, meeting them in both in their home and in their community setting where they can receive intensive treatment and the support they need. We commonly refer to this as our hospital without walls. At Menninger, we continue to pursue new, new discoveries in mental health. To date, more than 4,000 of our patients have contributed genetic information, brain images, and have participated in our health surveys and provided this data to our research team. This is allowing us to establish one of the world's largest collections of mental health research data. So with the support of our donors, we're now investigating the links between poor sleep and suicide, developing actionable strategies to reduce risk and save lives by just an example of the power uh, within the, the, the data that we've been able to collect. Now some of our most rewarding work is done in our community. Kate mentioned in Bridge Up. Through our Bridge Up program, we are sparking collaborations between schools and community organizations to create a network of mental health support, and this is targeted at our most vulnerable youth. During the fall semester alone, Bridge Up has helped to educate more than 5,500 students in social and emotional learning competencies. This is, includes self-awareness, 
responsible decision making, and relationship skills. In addition, BridgeUp is a model and as a model has enabled our schools to identify 450 students for learning behavior intervention and of those 200 were referred to mental health professionals to seek treatment. So it's remarkable what can be accomplished if we approach this together to advance the treatment and just like we're doing today to tackle the stigma related to mental health. At the Miniger Clinic, we take a team approach in caring for our patients. Everyone from the physician, the therapist, the nurse, the housekeeper, our dining staff, security, all working together to contribute to the wellness and to the care of our patients. I personally meet with patients every week, and most of them will tell me about their amazing team, their team that is treating them and making them well. The results of these conversations are so inspiring to me. When patients sit across from me, look me in the eye, and they will share comments such as, Menninger has saved my life, or my team has given me the tools to live. And most recently, in one of my patient visit visits, one of our patients on Hope looked at me and she said, I now feel beautiful on the inside. So look around your table. Look around this room. You too are part of this team that is helping to break down the barriers to treatment and together we are making a difference. So on behalf of the Menninger Clinic, I thank you again for your presence today, for your continued support of this clinic and all that we do to fight this stigma and to get the treatment available to those who need it. So now I, I ask you to please join me in welcoming our interim chief of staff, Dr. John Oldham. Dr. Oldham is an international expert in borderline personal, personality disorder and he's going to help us today also introduce this year's nominee. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, and thanks to all of you for your wonderful support for the Menninger Clinic. For most of us in the room, our speaker today is already well known as an amazingly talented NFL wide receiver who has set many records and won many awards. Texas is football country, after all. Um, so Brandon Marshall really needs no introduction, but all of us have a lot of parts. And not until a few years ago did we know anything about a different part of Brandon Marshall, which we'll hear him talk about shortly, who suffered and struggled with uncontrollable bouts of depression outbursts of anger, and behavior that was sometimes hurtful to those he loved and cared about. Only when he sought help at McLean Hospital did he learn that he was in the grips of something called borderline personality disorder. So just a few words about borderline personality disorder, or BPD as we call it. First of all, it is a brain disorder. It can run in families just like other conditions like diabetes, depression, or heart disease. And it can produce extreme suffering and impairment in functioning, especially by tangling up and disrupting relationships with others. Why is it called borderline? I tell patients and families at the Menninger Clinic that it's called that because someone with BPD is on the border of having a major mood disorder or a major impulse control disorder. Two prominent features of BPD are emotion dysregulation and loss of impulse control. In each of us, there's a deep part of the brain called the limbic system. That can be thought of as the brain's emotion center. People with BPD have an emotional engine that is overactive. Any little thing can trigger powerful emotions. But it's a double hit problem because the top-down regulator system of the brain that can cool the emotional heat or slow down the reckless impulse 
doesn't work very well. The engine's running hot and the brakes don't work. But the good news is that treatment works. I had the good fortune to chair the work group of the American Psychiatric Association that developed an evidence-based practice guideline for the treatment of borderline personality disorder. I'd like to mention that a member of that work group was the late Dr. John Gunderson, who was a good friend of mine and was one of the world's leading experts in BPD. And I single him out because Brandon has identified him as a key player in his treatment at McLean. The bottom line of the practice guideline is that psychotherapy is the core treatment for BPD, and we have good evidence that it is effective. Now, there's a lot more that could be said, but let me add one final note. We all know that stigma surrounds all forms of brain disorders. It takes phenomenal courage to seek help, to tell your family the things you've kept secret, to tell your friends, and especially to walk up to any podium and tell your story. But courageous and outspoken advocates like Brandon represent the most powerful antidote to the stigma that stubbornly clings to conditions like borderline personality disorder. Now, not only does Brandon speak out, but he and his wife, Michi, have founded an organization called Project 375, dedicated to overcoming the stigma that surrounds mental illness. Project 375 has a tagline that says it all. Quote, the way people think about mental illness is crazy, unquote. <laughs> Here's only one example of the work carried out by Project 375. Since 2017, its Project Prevent program has trained more than 1,200 parents, teachers, and school administrators in youth mental health first aid. This program teaches about risk factors and warning signs of mental illness in adolescents and provides guidance on how to help. Please go to Project 375's homepage and join in that conversation. Brandon and Michi, we owe you a huge debt of gratitude for being powerful voices in this crusade. On behalf of the Menninger Clinic, our CEO, Tony Gaglio, and I would like to present you with a replica of the large signature sculpture that sits in front of the clinic here in Houston. Moved from its original location in Topeka, the sculpture was named The Vital Balance, in honor of Dr. Carl Menninger, one of the founders of the clinic, and it was presented to him on his 90th birthday. Well, helping us all achieve a vital balance in our lives is the passionate goal of the Marshalls and Project 375. Tony and I are privileged to present this gift from the Menninger Clinic to Brandon Marshall and to Project 375. Uh, John, um, before I dive into my thank yous and all of that and get to the important stuff, can I have your notes? Because the number one question I always get is, what is borderline personality disorder? And I'm a patient, bro. I, I mean, <laughs> I can't articulate myself this well. So I'm just going to copy and paste this. 
Take it. So when people ask me, Miss Deborah's going to come up here. We're going to do a have a little panel discussion, right, and dive deep into our story. Uh, and I know that was probably a question she was going to ask. So I'm literally just going to read this, okay? All, all right, thank you. All Good job. <laughs> thank you, Menninger, um, and, the, and the entire staff. Uh, I spent three months in an outpatient program at McLean Hospital with Dr. John Gunderson, who's no longer with us, uh, the guy who changed my life, saved my life, and now uh, working through me to save others. Um, so thank you guys, because I know the work that you guys do is important. Not everyone makes it. Uh, it's tough, and you guys got to get up every single day, right, and um, do the work that you do, so thank you. The sponsors here, thank you guys so much for all that you have done to make this happen. Uh, supporting Kate and Jim and Peyton, the likes. Um, this is a beautiful event. Um, you guys look nice. <laughs> so I already spoke about Jim, Kate, Peyton. Uh, thank you guys for bringing us all together. Um, this is an amazing event, amazing turnout. Uh, what's your goal uh, as far as the money? The money, how much are we trying to raise? Okay, more. All right, I'll put a number on it. All right, we're going to try to raise 600000 today, okay? So I'm just going to put that out there right now. <laughs> I also want to thank uh, the president of our foundation, Carissa Johnson. She's amazing. Wave, Carissa. Where are you at? Somewhere over there. Oh, there you go. Stand up, Carissa. Stand up. So, yeah. So, Carissa, we actually were on campus together, uh, University of Central Florida, and she, I didn't know at the time that she was going to school and eventually went to get her master's degree in nonprofit. Uh, so, it was nice seeing you on campus, and now you're doing some phenomenal things with Project 375. So, thank you. All right. Um, a few things before the, the, the great Deborah Duncan come up here and uh, ask me a bunch of questions, and I'm just going to read. Um, Mr. John's notes, um, <clears throat> the things that come up for me as I receive this amazing award, uh, three things, fuel, it's fuel to keep going, right? Sometimes we put our head down and we just work and we can't appreciate the things that are happening around us or be present. You learn that in dialectical behavior therapy. Con uh, con uh, sorry. Um, confirmation, our stories matter. Peyton, your story matter, you know? You, you are saving lives and you will continue to do that. Your story matters. Uh, reminder that we're not done yet. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> it's funny, I didn't know all you guys existed back then, uh, but in 2011 when I stood in front of the media and it was broadcasted all over the place and I stood there after leaving McLean Hospital and when I said, I'm going to put a face to mental health and I'm going to be one of the voices to mental health. Um, I accompany that with, we want to take this from a taboo topic to an everyday conversation. And you guys have been pounding the pavement for years, long before I have. Um, but in these, these short years, this is an everyday conversation. It's at the forefront of our country. We're here now. Um, but now we just got to change the narrative. We got to break the stigma. People are talking about it, but are we talking about it the right way? Uh, so I just want to encourage you guys to continue to do the work that you're doing. Um, in this short period of time since I've been serving a community, there's been huge change. We went from a taboo topic to everyday conversations because of you guys all of your hard work and all of that money that we're going to raise and continue to raise, okay? All right, so Miss Deborah, I know you want to take the mic from me. So what do we have next? Right all right. All right, I want to start off with, it was J.J. Watt earlier, now Brandon Marshall. God is good. <laughs> 
and I saw you eyeing these flowers, I've already cleaned the flowers on this table right here. Oh, they're real. Yeah. All right. What's so interesting about, about what you're doing and who you are is that so often when we look at athletes, pro athletes, the behavior that you went through a couple of times, running with the law, uh, the anger issues, the whole bit, we not only forgive among the athletes, we also expect it. And so for you, you're highlighting something that's very interesting because a lot of times we forgive and expect things from a certain group and don't go deeper into the why. Yeah. And so um, you talked about how just growing up, it was all kind of environment and everything else and it was kind of expected, kind of accepted and excused. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I guess for me, I could identify some things if I, in retrospect, if I look back, uh, I can identify some things in my early adulthood. Oh man, that, that's isolation. Or maybe I was depressed then, you know? Or what was I thinking there? But when I go a little deeper, peel more layers back, and I go into my childhood, the things that I see in my story is more environmental, right? We talk about some of these emotional issues um, that people um, living with borderline personality disorder have. I can see that in my environment, my parents, uh, my friends and family, my neighbors. We weren't taught these things. We weren't taught to communicate the right way when something happens. You know, how do you sit down and effectively communicate? It wasn't until I was at McLean Hospital when Mrs. McPherson handed me a book called Difficult Conversation that I learned that communication was a skill, it was an art. It was something that was supposed to be taught. We didn't have that. Um, so looking back, I can see how not being in the right environment and a validating environment led to things in my early adulthood that could have been prevented. Some things, um, probably not, but environment definitely played a huge role. How did being young, rich, famous, boys will be boys, testosterone raging, <laughs> how did that play into putting basically, you know, like gasoline on the fire? Wow. Uh, it wasn't until probably like uh, four months ago where I, we, we did this little documentary for my 24th birthday. And the whole, like, I went my whole life thinking, man, I'm just a humble guy. I work hard. You know, I've never changed. And uh, I watched this replay of this birthday that I had. And I had a photographer there. And I was shocked and embarrassed at the type of guy that I was. I mean, I was using words I wouldn't usually use. Uh, just chest, just all out, and it definitely played a huge role. I didn't have the team around me at the time that can help guide me through that, right? Um, going from college, having um, no mail, no bank account, to a few months later, having all this freedom and access to the world and money, and, um, you know, you know, things kind of took, took a turn for, for the worse for me. You know, I, I wish I had... Uh, a few good men around me that can navigate me through something I've never been through. Now you are one of those good men. Uh, <laughs> oftentimes in healthcare, we show up in crisis mode, and we, we don't know to kind of manage things before it gets to that, that level. Take us back to that kind of coming to Jesus moment for you where you were on your knees and you knew you had to do something. You could not continue the way that you were. Wow, I mean, it's, we'll be here forever for that. You know, I got Kennard McGuire in the audience, my agent. Uh, he was actually the person when I, that moment that you're talking about, that specific moment where he flew down to, we just went from, now let me back up a little bit. I also got Mr. Rick Smith, where you at? He drafted me to the Denver Broncos, our great general manager for the Houston Texans um, for the past, what, 10 years or so. Um, so, Going back then, and then also having Kennard, like there's so many things that happen, right? I'm sure Rick, you know, and his staff were able to see, like, hey, this is a guy we may need to um, do a post check on every once in a while. We just gotta do some red flags and moving forward, you know. Then there's, you know, Kennard McGuire comes into my life, my agent, and when we talk about a few good men, he wasn't there the first three years, <clears throat> and I remember walking probably out of Rick's building and 
and going into the parking lot and Kennard, signing with Kennard. But that moment for me, uh, I thought everything was okay. You know, I, I was, I remember Kennard walking into my house and I had my Bible with me. And I'm like, oh man, I'm great, man. I gave my life to Christ a year ago. And Kennard was like, no, you need help. And I said, no, man, I'm good, man. I'm, I'm okay, man. I, I, I promise you, man. It's just, you know, the people around me and this person and that person just blaming everyone else. And he said, no, you need help. You, you were on top of the world for those of us from the outside looking in, but you didn't feel like you were on top of the world. You were depressed. And people can look at the external things, you know, beautiful yeah. wife, you got a lot of money, you got this cool job, all this type of stuff. Those external things quickly fade away and don't mean much when you're sitting in the middle of depression. Well, well, yeah, I mean, in, in that moment, you know, I was sitting in this 12,000 square foot home uh, in our theater room at the time when Kennard said, no, you need to go see Dr. Gunderson, you need to go to McLean Hospital. And the next day I was on a private plane uh, to McLean Hospital. How did you and, receive that? Because that's, yeah. that's, we talk about the stigma and that's kind of the, the hurdle for a lot of yeah. people when it's, the help is there, but you gotta connect somebody in need with those who can help. How did you receive that information initially or were you at that point where whatever it takes? Well, um, you know, because we're in, yeah, so Kennard and my assistant, Kathy Lee, they were the only two people that flew down. And um, as we're sitting there, you know, usually, you know, they, they're just great people. Kennard is an amazing man and very loving. And that was the first time he looked me in my eyes and said, no, you're going to do this. He always gave me options. He's always educated me, whether it was, you know, hey, we're leaving uh, the Denver Broncos and going to the Miami Dolphins. Here's your options. Here's the finances, how everything is broken down. Marketing deals, financial advisors. He's always, the likes, you know, the likes helped me financially. Um, uh, Jim likes, you know, when he was back with Encore, the bank, you know, Kennard set that up and, um, you know, so he's always put great people in front of me and um, always educated me. And this was the first time where he didn't give me an option. So I, how, when he said it and he's like, no, you need to go, uh, I just kind of just looked at him and said, all right, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> it's a big eye opener for you. As we know, mental health, mental illness is not a one size fits all. It's all kinds of situations. You really can't even compare them because if somebody feels a certain way, they feel a certain way. You were sitting in the room with other people who had gone to McLean as well, yeah. and you just saw everyone dealing with a situation. And I think you said when they, and then they, they like basically spilled everything and then walked to the parking lot, got in their cars, and oh, left. Yeah. Oh, you're, you know. I you did, did my research. Work. I'm you a talk show host. <laughs> so when she's, we did a documentary. So uh, all that with Kennard was on film. You know, I, this is why I know this work is, this is God sent. Because when I was in that situation, that moment that you talked about, I called this videographer that did that same video for me for my 24th birthday. And I said, man, I don't know what's going to happen, but just come over here and shoot. And just film everything. And for three months, Pretty much four months, he shot every day, like almost every hour. It was the young girl sitting next to you who had the bandages. Yep. So, yep. so um, we, we, there's a, uh, I call it Borderline Beast, this documentary that we did. I haven't released it yet. And um, I remember being in self assessment, sitting in this circle. Self assessment, a lot of you guys know what it is, some may, may not. But you sit in a circle and you basically just talk about what's going on with you that day, you know, you're, what's go, you know what, what you're experiencing. And I'm sitting there, and this particular group, I had a young lady sitting next to me who tried to take her life the night before. But she was, I couldn't understand how, how you had that happen, and then now you're sitting in self-assessment. I didn't understand that. Um, and then there was another young lady in the group um, who had a bandage on her arm. And that was my first time seeing, seeing, I heard about it, but seeing someone who self-harmed themselves cutting, right? And there was blood seeping through. Um, and it, I mean, it was a story after story after story. And here I was, this big macho football player, and I'm taking all this in. And um, we walk out in the parking lot, and there was like 300 cars. And I just saw all of us leave group self-assessment and I was going to Reebok to go train, Reebok's headquarters in Boston. So I was going, leaving campus to go train 
Another lady was going back to be an insurance broker. Another lady was an attorney. Another one's a student. Another lady going back to the a hospital. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like how many others are out there uh, just walking around amongst us dealing with this same thing, right? Like you would think like the stories that we were just sharing that we were supposed to be in a hospital. Like why are we leaving campus? And we all left self-assessment, got in the car, and like everything was okay. And that shocked me. Yeah. And I actually captured that, right? Like, like the parking lot. And I'm pretty sure some of them was faculty and staff, but to me it was all patience. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing you, you, you touched on too, is that it's anybody and everybody. Yeah. It's not somebody else because of some other, because you're poor, or because you're this, or because you're that. Um, I, I remember I was on top of the world. I had the car that I want, the house that I want. I had the body I want, 10% body fat. There you go, right there. <laughs> yeah, not this body, it was an older body, it was another body. <laughs> It was, it was my catching body, my go-to-the-club body, right? But, but I, I, and I was, I was in my bed, miserable, depressed. Yeah. And had it not been for friends who came and, and, and got me out of bed, in fact, one of my friends from Boston, Shane, it was Double D, if you don't get out of bed, I'm going to kill you before you kill yourself, yeah. right? <laughs> but, and I can't explain what it was. I just know what it was, and I'm glad that I came out of it. But for so many other people, they can't just come out of it. Um, and part of it is the stigma. Part of it is just the right treatment, which is what Menninger is about. It's not always about a prescription. It's about so many different things. Um, for you, okay, so you get the diagnosis. What have you known about mental health before? Oh, for me, mental health was, uh, wow. To, so how do I say this? Um, as a football player, uh, for me, mental health really was mental toughness. You know, that's what we're trained, be mentally tough. So what does that look like for a male, for an athlete, for a professional football player to mask pain, right? So me communicating or sharing what was going on inside would be the opposite of what I've been taught my entire life. So if, before I went to McLean Hospital, if you asked me what is mental health and mental fitness is like being able to take on everything and not express anything to anyone. So I was a ticking time bomb. I would just sit there with all these things going on and just the behavioral issues that we we're talking about was like, Phew! right? Um, so that, that's what, I've, what I learned and what I um, came to realize when I was at McLean Hospital. And um, what's interesting is when I left McLean Hospital, people couldn't get me to shut up. Like, I, before, it was this, this ticking time bomb, and I wouldn't say anything. Then it would be like, well, where did this come from? Why are you now yelling and screaming at me? And when we got to Chicago, um, you know, people call Kennard all the time, their general manager, the owner, everyone. It's like every little thing, I'd be in her office. Hey, so this is what I'm feeling, you know? <laughs> I'm just like, I just need to get this out. <laughs> laughing about it, but what is that like to be able to just, and, and what was, you, take us through that moment you decided to come out publicly and say, this is what I deal with every yeah. day, it doesn't define me, but it's a part of my life, and to do this in a way that was empathetic and, and sympathetic. Well, you know, I mean, Miss, I think Miss Pam, one of the ladies here, and Pam, yeah, Pam, so yeah, Miss Pam walked up to me earlier, and she's like, oh my gosh, you're so brave, and I get that a lot. Right, like for you to tell your story, because I understand the stigma around it and um, the, 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 what you can face by saying, hey, this is who I am, this is what I live with, right? But when I left, when I was, when I left that self-assessment uh, group and I walked into that parking lot, it, it was over for me. It was like, you know, hey, I've been here a month and a half and I've been radically changed. And for me to get access to a McLean Hospital for me to um, have, act, have the resources I need to change my life, literally save my life, uh, that was shocking to me because it cost 30 something thousand dollars a month, right? I had to travel all the way to Waltham, Massachusetts, Boston. And I'm like, what about the others who can't afford this? Like I was blessed to be an NFL guy, um, be in the NFL and make so much money because I could afford that, right? Um, so for me, it was a no-brainer. It was like, no, I have, to, I have to tell this story. And it wasn't about my story. It was like, listen, like literally I lived like this for six years, right? And if, forget all the stuff that you can Google. 
I mean, I sat on the couch like this. This is how I look. At what would have been somebody else's dream life. Correct, in a 12,000 square foot home um, with a Jaguar outside and a Mercedes Benz, um, you know, lit palm trees outside, you know, literally have 14 royal palms in my front yard, right? <laughs> I'm in South Florida, could travel anywhere, beautiful wife. She has like five degrees. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, and I literally sat there for six years. So for me to go from that to where I was in a, a month and a half, I said, man, um, you know, we, we need to fix this, you know, and because I didn't understand what mental health was. Just like you said earlier, like, what did it mean for you? It yeah. was to mass pain, yeah. be tough. Yeah, uh, you know, it was a time when Menninger wasn't here. That's you right. know, we didn't have this here. And um, where's Liz at? Do you mind if I tell a little bit of the story? Okay, so uh, Jim McInvale calls the show and he says, I, I, there's a situation with one of my daughters and we don't know what to do. We don't know, do you know somebody? Do you know where to go? And uh, we had done some things with Miniger, but we flew them in from other cities mm -hmm. and, and talked about things. And so just so y'all realize, those of you who don't realize, that Miniger is such a gift in this city. It is such a gift in this city. And that's what we're supporting here today. Because as Liz has talked about before, it's like we need more people to have access to the care yeah. there. I oftentimes say um, you might not choose your mission, but your mission chooses you. This mission has chosen you. Yeah. And you've risen to the occasion. Tell us about Project 375. Ah, uh, yeah, the way people think about mental health is crazy, you know. <laughs> Chris, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. Chris, uh, my wife, you know, they, they do a great job. They do all the work. They really do. They do all the heavy lifting, all of our programming. Um, they travel around the country soon, around the world, uh, teaching people to be first responders, mental health first day. I think that's where it starts, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't the end all be all for us, but we feel like this is the first phase. Well, this is the second phase. The first phase for us was to continue to tell our stories, to tell other people's stories, right? So now we're seeing people pop up all over the place, The Rock and Demi Lovato, like, hey, like it's like the cool thing now. Mariah Carey. Like this, yeah. yeah, like, hey, I, like, like it's a badge of honor. Like, hey, yeah, I live with depression. Like, I suffer from this, I suffer from that. Uh, which is good, but we just have to change the narrative and we have to make sure that when we do speak, we're not playing into the stigma. Uh, but now phase two is for us to make sure that our parents, our teachers, our staff, our hospitals, our police departments are actually trained to be able to stand in a gap until our kids can get, or folks can get to Miniger yeah. or the McLean hospitals. So that's where we're at right now and just really training people um, like we're over a thousand now. Um, that's where we're at now. And the, and the next phase would be for us to be able to have more Menningers all over the world. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Odom uh, mentioned earlier that there can be a genetic component at times. You just had a brand new baby. Oh, yeah. Yes. So you have three kids now. Three kids, yes. Thank you. So what is it that you will look for? And, and, and what is the message that you want uh, parents to hear and yeah. kids to hear? Well, I would say this, when it comes to parenting, um, and just from our experience, my wife, she, I mean, I don't even know if I needed to go to a McLean hospital, she could have treated me at home <laughs> if I wasn't so difficult, maybe if she had a team, maybe if Dr. John came down with her and supported her. Um, <clears throat> but some of the things that we're doing with our children is, we're teaching them to communicate. I mean, since they're four years old, Twins, boy and a girl, Z and Ziggy, just had a baby two weeks ago. Because when they're two years old, all bets are off. They're all crazy. Okay, yeah. at two years old. <laughs> but like I said, a lot of, some of it is environmental, right? There's some things that we can instill in our kids that will help them, right? So even when that, when that one thing does come up um, that we're not prepared for, they're comfortable enough to say, hey, I need help. Right. Judgment. So since they were one and two years old and doing baby talk, it's like, no, use your words. Yeah. No, what are you saying? Communicate. So now my children, since, I mean, they're four now, um, but for a year and a half, they walk around and say, Ziggy, Ziggy hit me and you hurt my feelings. <laughs> I love it. Right? That's my son, right? Because men, we're not, and that makes me proud. Men, you, what, do, what does it come off like? You hurt my feelings. I am sad, but I'm now like this. <laughs> <sighs> Right? But what I really want to say is, like, you just hurt my feelings, right? So for my son to walk around at three years old and say, you hurt my feelings, not only just to my daughter, but he also says it to me. 
Like, Daddy, you hurt my feelings, right? So we're teaching them how to communicate. We're teaching them how to validate each other, validate others, um, to validate themselves, uh, self-love, self-care. Um, one of the things that we read to them before bedtime, another thing that I do, it's, um, you know, I'm sure you guys heard this thing called Headspace, but they have, uh, you know, this uh, feature for babies from the ages two to like five. So um, I think his name is Andy. And I'll tell, you know, like, hey, we're gonna put Andy on tonight, right? So it's like two to five minute um, practices and they just, like at night, meditate, understand how to be present, right? So there's a, some of the things that we do for our children so we can instill in them now, all right, this, and I call it superpowers. So when my son is crying or daughter's crying or if they're getting worked up, you know, I tell them, use your superpowers. And their superpowers is the things that I learned in dialectical behavior therapy, radical acceptance, communication, like all those things, right? Because I don't want them to think that this is a, um, this is something that is going to um, diminish them, but it's going to increase their capacity, right? Like, no, use your superpowers, right? So now they know, like, man, this is going to make me a stronger human being. Yeah. That needs to be the curriculum in daycare, in schools, and the whole bit. And let me end with this. All of you, I want you to think about something you did that you would be ashamed if anyone knew, especially if you had to get up here on stage and talk about it. I'm not saying just your college days, even something you may have done yesterday, but think about it. What it takes, that courage to come out and, and feel like you can do it and be heard, number one, but to also impact change. So we wanna thank you so much for coming up here and several other stages across the country and impacting and motivating a change in this country when it comes to mental health and mental illness. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming here today. Thank you.